Uh, thanks for coming along, everyone. Um, we've got a few, a couple of topics to discuss today, mostly focusing on um, booking once again to try and help move um, that discussion forward. I'm just going to share. Nope. I'll share the wrong screen. Bear with me whilst I share the right slides. All right, there we go. Okay, so agenda for today, um, I just kind of wanted to quickly uh, bring everybody else up to speed on a couple of discussions we've been having around the activity list. Um, then on the booking spec, um, pick up a conversation that we didn't get time to cover last time, which is around the uh, how we support provider initiated cancellations. Um, there's also an issue around uh, description of tax as part of pricing, um, which uh, Nick has been exploring is going to give us an update on um, and then uh, just AOB uh, I just wanted to briefly chat about the next couple of calls as well because we've got Christmas coming up um, so on the the activity list um, I had a call with a, a few people uh, at the end of last week um, to take them through um, some thoughts about how we manage the shared activity list uh, and how that gets um, updated in future. Um, so just to let everybody know what we covered there, um, uh, I, uh, there's some links to slides here um, and a demo site. Um, essentially, uh, we've uh, identified a, uh, uh, an open source tool for managing uh, taxonomies and uh, similar uh, control vocabularies. Um, which we have um, set up as a demo um, and populated it with the current version of the activity list. Um, the outcome of the, the meeting, which was really just to kind of demo the features, was that I think everyone feels comfortable that that will allow us to um, share the work of managing the list across the community. Um, so to move that forward, we're gonna go ahead and set up a live version of the tool, um, uh, identify a few people who can form part of the initial editorial team. So that's people from a few different organizations across the sector who have already provided uh, some help on curating the initial list. Um, and then we're going to look slightly wider uh, and get some input from other people on the, the content of and structure of the list. But I, I, I'm pretty confident now that we can move that forward quite quickly um, and let the community kind of manage uh, the content um, and publication schedule of that. Um, so I'll do some more updates on that uh, over the coming weeks as things move forward, but I just want to make sure everyone was uh, aware of those discussions. Um, any, any questions on, on that before I move on to the, the booking stuff? No? Okay. Well, uh, shout it if, if there is. Okay, so that's, that's the progress on the activity list. Um, so uh, the last call we um, were talking about the revised um, the revised kind of workflow for the booking API, um, which uh, Nick and I have, have uh, discussed uh, since then, um, and our plan for moving that forward is to do some do a, a further revision of the booking API spec um, to do another kind of candidate release of that. Um, and then we can get into the next le uh, level of feedback. But the, the outcome of the call was that I think everyone felt that the, um, the revised workflow would work better for everyone. Uh, so that's, uh, that's promising, um, but the bit that we didn't really get time to discuss was uh, the, how we handle um, provider-initiated cancellations. So we have a requirement. So at the moment within the, the booking API, um, a broker can cancel a booking on behalf of a user. So there is a mechanism to do that. But in reality, uh, there will be occasions where a provider needs to uh, cancel a booking. Perhaps you know, somebody's ill or an event has to be rescheduled, um, or canceled rather. Um, and so there needs to be a way for uh, brokers to, be, to uh, track whether those cancellations have happened outside of their application, so on the, on the platform side. Um, and that's important because then they can initiate refunds, do any customer updates that they need to do. Um, we have the, the current 
uh, API draft has a proposal in there based on uh, webhooks, um, which uh, we've had some feedback on, I'll go through in a moment. But basically, there's, there's two options here that we could, uh, we could explore. Um, the first is a kind of simple polling setup. So that would require brokers to regularly check or so regularly do a request to a booking platform to see if there have been any cancellations. Um, if, the, if, they, um, uh, if they see that there has been a status update for an order, then they can get the, um, any extra information they need by doing a uh, request to the, uh, to the individual order. But the, the onus here would be on the broker to monitor uh, and keep polling um, just in case there are any uh, notifications um, and then they can take appropriate action. So the requirement would be for the booking platforms to expose uh, an extra API endpoint to make this or similar information available uh, to brokers. Um, so there's a bit of work on both sides, but most of the work is actually on the broker side because they will need to regularly poll for the information. Lee, can I ask a question there? This is Ros from Exxon Leisure. Yeah, sure. Um, so would the, um, the, the response be um, uh, any cancellations from bookings that that broker has made? So would it be a list or would it be an individual? Uh, are they polling for a particular person or just anything that they have booked that has been cancelled? Is there a time frame on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so my assumption would be, and, and I've got a, um, a, not a full proposal, but a slightly more detailed proposal to cover afterwards. But the, um, my assumption is that the broker uh, would be requesting um, to a generic endpoint and they would just get a list of uh, updated orders that are relevant to them. So it wouldn't be all orders in the platform. It would just be a list of orders that have been placed by that particular broker. Right, okay. But in um, terms of, uh, of windowing, et cetera, is something that we can, uh, we can uh, discuss. Um, but so polling is one option. The other option, which is what we've, we've documented so far, is a webhook. So here it kind of uh, changes things around a little bit. So the booking platform notifies the broker every time, either every time uh, an order is cancelled or perhaps it does it you know, once an hour or once a day and you get an a, a update for a, for a batch. But basically it's a push model. Uh, so the platform pushes notifications to the broker and then the broker would then um, make any subsequent requests that it needed to. Um, so uh, we've had, had some feedback uh, both in earlier calls and on, on GitHub. Um, just to kind of summarize that, um, whatever we choose, there's some extra implementation required. Um, but I think the feeling was that uh, the webhooks were, sli were slightly more complicated and added um, extra overhead both sides because, a, uh, for example, a broker will need to expose an API, uh, probably a secure API that a, a platform can make requests to. So they will have to be offering um, you know, an, um, a basically a managed API for the platforms that they're working with. Um, the other bits of feedback we had was that there were concerns about uh, what happens if webhooks fail? Um, so if a booking platform doesn't get a response from a broker to, to, to the, they know that the notification has been acknowledged, then what happens? You know, is there a fixed number of retries? Um, yeah, we, we would certainly prefer the polling option. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in looking around as well at other uh, other bits of feedback where people have been implementing webhooks. There have been lots of concerns over, um, you know, a failure that um, brokers, well, brokers or people who are supposed to be receiving no, uh, webhook notifications not properly managing or scaling their endpoint to deal with uh, notifications as they come in. Um, but that, I mean, there are some positives to webhooks. I mean, firstly, the notifications can be faster because they could be, you know, potentially. Uh, as, as status updates take place. Um, and there may be other types of notification that um, we need to pass between 
uh, brokers and uh, platforms, uh, and it'd be a web hook could provide a generic mechanism for that. Um, but you know, it felt I think on the whole, uh, it felt like people were a bit more concerned about using web hooks um, in terms of overhead, failure modes, etc. So I think what what we're going to do is um, uh, revise the specification to focus on um, polling as a, a the preferred option. Um, I think we will keep webhooks as a as a feature, but make it optional. Um, and we can discuss whether uh, we just add that in a 2.0 version, or whether we leave it in at the moment as, but just as an optional thing that people can support um, if there's a need for more real time updates. Um, so the the proposal would be um, that there would be a uh, a, a notifications endpoint as part of the, the booking spec and the broker would poll that um, and it would return a list of um, order notifications which would indicate uh, which order has, uh, has had its state changed um, and then the broker can again uh, do further get requests to get any other context that might be available as part of the order. Um, a a webhook then could be an optional webhook feature can come can be added on top of that um, if a platform wants to support it. Hi Lee, can I just ask a quick question on this? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, just in terms of implementation, I'm just thinking that uh, it's you can actually get in standard queues. So if you're going to send a whole chunk of things off to a webhook and it's not reliable delivery, then you can put it in a queue, MSM queue, or something like that. And that makes the architecture very simple. If, however, you're going to poll, then I think you've potentially got to build quite a lot of architecture in to make that to make that work. So you need to keep the state that might need to go to all of your different um, uh, third parties, your integrators, middleware, whatever it's called these days. And that's possibly more work. Don't know. Just just something you think about. Yeah. Yeah. I. So I th so if we think about what you would need for a webhook, then on the on the on the platform side, then using a queue um, to manage outgoing requests uh, seems fine. You know, it would be a way to uh, to handle that. Um, you will need to handle. I mean, I know some queuing systems will do retries of of deliveries, um, but I think uh, you would also need to have a fallback of somebody being able to check for missed uh, missed updates. Um, I think for polling, I think there's only two bits of information you need in order to be able to generate a list of notifications. It's the, um, I guess three, the current status of the order, which I, th I think you'll be tracking anyway, date of last uh, uh, update to the order or state change, depending on the granularity you want to capture, um, and which pro broker placed that order, which I think you will need anyway in order to um, monitor um, you know, who's placing orders in your system. So I don't think there's an extra requirement in terms of um, a big extra requirement in terms of data for, for either option really. Um, with a webhook, you'll also have to manage um, you know, what, what the endpoint is. Um, we'll have to also standardize what uh, the security, or I'll give some recommendations about how those uh, endpoints are secured as well. All fair points, thank you. Can I ask a question, sorry Lee? Um, is yeah. there any recommendation on the time of uh, the time of uh, what's the word of, of keeping the data of, of uh, the cancellations for example would it be up to one month and then they would drop off or would it be up to a week is it was it at the discretion of the um, the uh, the provider yeah well that yeah that's a good question um, I, I, I kind of turn that around and say what what do you think would be useful um, my, my starting suggestion would be that um, what's returned is just a um, a time ordered list of status updates so that a broker could just kind of page through and and um, but over time that, that could get quite big I, I, mean, I mean so my my initial response would be one month if, if somebody can't process the broker, the broker can't process those within a month or maybe or maybe two months just to account for things like people checking credit card details and that sort of thing um, you know, you can see if it, if it ran for a few months and there's been a few cancel, you know, quite a few cancellations over certain periods, that that list is going to go really, go really big very quickly, isn't it? 
and then the, the amount of data you're putting back all the time will be quite big. Yeah, okay. Any other thoughts on that? Time windows? Um, just in thinking about how this kind of relates to other things that we've got in terms of the RPDE endpoints and stuff like that, um, I guess one view on this could be uh, that it's, a, it's an RPDE endpoint of orders. Um, that's it, per, but you're obviously filtering per broker. Um, and what that gives you is that it means that you can retrieve um, the latest state of all orders as they come through. Uh, and, and choose to only pick up on those orders that um, have a state change that you care about or or whatever. Um, so just thinking about if if we did it in an extensible way so that you basically have an uh, orders endpoint rather than like a like a poll you you poll the orders endpoint rather than pulling a notifications endpoint, then you could do more in terms of. What I guess you push through, but then I guess the converse of that is maybe a generic notifications endpoint um, is useful, but then you'd have to build, because if you have an orders endpoint, you can literally do at the very, very basic level, the same as what people do for RPDE feeds, where they have the orders table um, and just the simple SQL query is, um, you know, uh, filter where broker equals X uh, and date is less than whatever. And that gives you just a slice of the orders that have changed since then. Um, so they're a very simple implementation. Whereas if we have notifications, that requires us to build another, or brokers to build, uh, sorry, booking systems to build another table. Um, why does it need another table? Well, assuming that you would want more generic notifications in there, I guess. Or unless you, well, I suppose you could power it from the same table. Can you just call it notifications? Unless until it got more complicated. Mm, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, anyone else got any thoughts or comments? I quite like the IDP idea because I think that however we do, it's got to be incremental, and the IDP is a is is a. Um, environment that all the um, middleware will be familiar with. So I think there's some scope for that, actually. Yeah, I, I'm just sorry, I've just been willing over that. Yeah, that probably sounds like a good idea. Because you could go back, I suppose, as well, and, and um, retrieve the last one that you wanted. Or if there's a query and you knew it was in a certain set, you could go back and retrieve that set as well. Hmm. Yeah, so you could effectively would that allow the broker to synchronize its state with the um, with the booking system in the same way. But I suppose the question there is, if we did use RPDE, and I think I think yeah, the the main thing is everyone's going to be familiar with it and have implemented it, so they'll know what they're doing, as you say. Um, whether we would include the payload in there as well, or whether we would just include uh, the ID and then have call, but you know, have the consumer then call. Uh, back to get the latest um, order. So basically, do we do we? Because at the moment, I don't think the from the last proposal revision, I don't don't know if we have a get order. I don't think we have a get order endpoint. Uh, I don't, well, we don't have the need to have one because when you when you've posted the order, you get the order back straight away, but you don't necessarily need to then get it subsequently. Although we could have it. Well, um, we do need it if you're going to be able to do um, broker side cancellations. You need to be able to um, update the order. Would you not need just to post? Oh, I see. Yes, you want to get it first and then post back an update. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what I would think is so I've got uh, just an example on the slide um, that the, you would have a no, uh, slash notifications which would basically return a paged collection of order notifications, which just might have the order ID, status, and timestamp. Um, so for the, for the opportunity API, we're gonna need to have lists, be able to share lists of things as well. Um, so I was leaning towards making it consistent with what we might use there rather than RPDE. Um, but the basic mechanism of having uh, a list of items and then a next page link would be consistent across them 
um, there'd just be some slight differences in at least what I would originally been thinking around what the JSON structure would look like. Um, because the RPD currently is not JSON LD. Hmm. Wonder if there's an opportunity here to improve RPD, maybe, or or converge the two. I'm just thinking in terms of the next because if we do paging without using modified date and ID as RPD does, we're going to be in well, all all the problems of having um, to page through and create pages and maintain them, uh, all that stuff. Whereas if you just have like RPD, there's just the windows defined by those parameters, then you've got a really simple query um, to return the page. Yeah, I think, isn't it, but isn't all of that just hidden on the server side anyway? You know, in terms of what we're defining, there's just a, a place that you can go to to get a list of notifications and then a pointer to next page. Um, the, you know, it's up to, it'd be up to the um, booking system to decide at, what page size it wants or how it wants to organize those. Sure. So using the RPD mechanism, but changing the schema to be closer to JSON LD. Yeah. Yeah. It felt like it just felt like including this as an extra, this is a feature in booking. Um, and then with a view to RPD 2.0 also being consistent with that as well. I mean, we could, we could try and rev, RPD first. Um, well, I, I guess what I'm thinking is we've already got validators for RPD and people will be can have have their own implementations. So it, I don't know if at this stage in, in booking 1.0, whether it's worth, are we basically doing too much by trying to bump RPD? I think you're right. We probably do need to look at, I, I think there's even already a proposal in the RPD um, uh, GitHub about it, uh, bumping it to be a JSON LD compliant. And there's a bunch of considerations about how we would do that. Um, well, I suppose the risk of trying to do that early here is that we do it, don't quite do it, that we, we kind of do something slightly different and then RPD2 actually ends up being different again. Uh, and maybe it's rather than um, basically pick, pick a standard that's consistent with something we already have, use that. And then when we bump RPDE to be better, uh, which sounds like it's almost certainly a thing that needs to happen at some point, um, then we would apply that change across both. Um, and have it consistent and then update the validators accordingly and all the other stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, th there's a, there's the, uh, what's it called? Hydra outlines a JSON LD kind of uh, paged set of collections. And that's what we were discussing using for the Opportunity API. That's kind of what I've borrowed from here. Uh, and my assumption was that RPD would go in that same direction as well. So. So I, I'm, I'm less concerned that we'll end up with slightly different mechanisms. Um, well, for example, um, RPDE has the items in the collection have modified date and ID um, as particular properties, and they're quite they have a particular meaning. So there's discussions to have about what they look like in JSON LD land, whether they still exist in the same object, whether they whether there's a parent object like the current is, which is the item, and then, then the data exists within the item. Um, and also some considerations about the modified date uh, and how we make that consistent across um, the various places you might get this item from. So you might get an item, you might get an update from the RPD feed, you might also get one from the Opportunity API, you might also get one from um, notifications, whatever, um, different places. So making that consistent so that you can resolve when you have a new object from one of those places, you can tell it's a, it's a newer version. So you can do something with that, you know, compare it to the others, etc. cetera. Um, but I guess what, what it probably comes down to is that, uh, yes, I think Hydra is a good, good thing to, to use. And I think that's, that's almost, uh, what, um, some of that early work you already uses, but again, it's the same question. If we're, is it the right is it the right way around to do it like this basically are we are we um and why if so why um what's the what's the reasoning for trying to to get this in here rather than doing it across the piece so so my rationale would be um we try to scope the changes to the thing that we're actively working on so rather than try to get booking over the line and then get a new edition of rpde and people adopting that 
that we focus on keeping the booking spec as self-contained as possible um, and introduce the, the endpoint into here um, for, you know, with, for the, uh, to meet the requirements that we have and then separately look at uh, any changes to RPE. Because I think that we'll, if we start changing that, we'll end up with um, a whole other set of requirements that we need to deal with, which might delay booking. Agreed. Well, I suppose, but I, I guess what I'm wondering is, is the, does, but does the halfway work? So isn't, 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 aren't the two options really use RPDE as is for everything um, because it's, it's known and we've got the, you know, every, everyone will, will have the, they're already built some stuff to implement that um, and process that on the, on both sides or, um, or change RPDE so that it, it's improved. Um, but using something that isn't RPDE right now and isn't yet either RPDE2 is, is using a, isn't that kind of divergent from um, your respects? Well, that might depend on, on, on quite what everybody else <laughs> means by use RPDE. So perhaps that's a question I'll put to everyone. The, um, so to me, RPDE uh, provides a, a couple of things. It's got a simple, um, basically a simple JSON based API to page through a list. Um, there is some wording in the spec about how to consistently order that list and the behavior of the items in that list of um, when uh, statuses change. Um, which bits were of people that think we should be uh, using to inform this particular piece of work? Is it just that we've got a simple paging mechanism or do we think that everything that's currently specified in RPDE will also apply here? I, my initial assumption um, from what Nick was saying was the paging mechanism because we, we effectively if we're pulling cancellations and this is this is mainly what we're talking about you could have some way of paginating it uh, otherwise you're going to be adding pulling too much or too little getting out of sync um, it may well be that we want to just put the RG, RDB pagination protocol wrapping around something in the um, the booking API um, one thing I am concerned about um, is that uh, you know we don't need to just jump off and get more complexity in because we're struggling. I say struggling, that's the wrong word. I mean, the whole process is taking a while. And I think if we keep it simple as far as we can, then that's better. Um, but as I said, I, I was seeing the, 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 what Nick's suggestion meant was having a, using the syntax of the page protocol to pull things back. And what the payload was would be kind of cancellations or changed orders or whatever. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure if that made sense, but that's that's what I thought you meant. Yeah, I agree on the the simplicity side. Um, in the example that's on the screen, that's that looks would be fine for me in terms of the, just the fact that it's been cancelled and which order it is, so you can deal with it. On the, the broker can deal with it, and in terms of the paging, again, it's it, it's been able to record how far into that paging set you've you've already gone and then if you need to go back and get you know the next set of pages um at whatever time you you want to you want to do okay nick any comments um yeah so i guess i guess the simplicity point um is that I, I think i would be i definitely agree with that and um yeah, so I, th I think I think for me, um, from an implementation perspective, using the schema that exists from RPDE is probably the simplest way forward, um, without defining anything new uh, at this stage. Um, just in terms of basically using a, using a thing that we have that's known that works, um, and yeah, and then and then I think in the future uh, we should we should absolutely uh, we, we should look to change change that and change that altogether. But um, I, I expect, I suppose, if we are, if we do um, do that, well, we should do that. And when we when we do that, um, get to the question about what that's going to uh, impact. And so everyone's going to have to do an update across quite a bit of. Well, I mean, everyone's going to have to change their feeds, and their booking as part of that kind of makes sense um, because most people will be using both. Um, well, I, yeah, I guess I guess they, they will possibly. Although I can also see systems that will only be just using the Opportunity API and booking. 
Um, so I, th I think the reason why I'm hesitating a little bit about saying use RPD is it means that we'll have a, an API that will be using JSON-LD throughout, use a consistent model, and then for one endpoint, we'll be right, relying on a, on a spec uh, of which I think a chunk of it is not relevant. So it won't be saying we'll use RPDE, it'll be RPD, but please ignore these sections. Cause I'm not sure that you'd need all of these like uh, paging mechanisms after timestamp, after ID. Well, you do, well, I suppose this. And all of this is written in terms of, um, uh, you know, kind of events and facilities. Well, so the only the, there's only there's only one reference to the event stuff, which is which is in the payload recommendation. But I think generally, when we get into looking at how paging works, I think you do need to use modified date and uh, ID together if you're doing paging in the same way, because if you have multiple notifications at exactly the same time, they won't have a deterministic ordering otherwise. Um, and then, and then the same arguments follow. So, okay, so right, so we need a deterministic ordering, therefore you have modified date and ID, but what if you have an incrementing integer, uh, such as is the case in some systems um, that, um, like um, SQL Server, then can you use that? In which case the change number comes in so that you can use that instead to simplify your implementation further. Um, and deleted items, it's the same when notifications, you probably wanna remove them at some point um, from that feed, so you probably wanna delete items I don't, there's not, this spec is quite light, so I don't know what else there is really that we're, um, there's a last page required because you'd need a spec to say when you'll get to the end of the feed, what happens next? How do you deal with that? That's in there. Um, uh, I think everything in stream filtering, which is, a, which is a bit of a minor thing, is probably the only thing that is edge case here. Um, content type, use JSON. Um, yeah. Um, how to poll um, recommendations about polling and um, all that stuff. So it's got the whole it's got the whole payload section, which is potentially not relevant. Which is where where sorry the well all of the stuff around date and time formats, all of this extra stuff, which is not really which is which was designed originally where to really? allow other other JSON structures in there. Well, the date and time format is probably the only one really. Um, if you go to the example, I think that's probably, that's probably the easiest thing, 4.7. So um, you can see there there's data um, inside which there's the JSON LD and outside data there's state kind ID modified and items and next. So really what we're really talking about here is next items, state kind ID modified. What's in data is, um, well, potentially an order object with an ID, I guess, or whatever, whatever JSON LD we want to put in there. Um, but the, this spec doesn't explicitly doesn't include anything to do with what's in data. The spec is all it, is all it talks about is the items on state kind ID and modified stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. The the bit that I was uh, was that I, I wasn't wasn't convinced that we needed even this payload option um, because I think the model that we were going talking about for the Opportunity API was to have more of a, a link. You get a list and then you uh, you do further requests to get extra information rather than embedding things. But you you could put that in the data, right? The, the previous slide, you could, on, the, on the side, you could put the order notification object mm. in the data. And that would be with, a, with the order in order status. And that would be that. Mm. And then you don't need modified because that's already in the, um, in the items um, block outside. It would just be state kind ID modified data would then contain those three properties. Yeah. Okay. I know you don't like it because it's not JSON LD. That's the, I, I I get that totally get that, and I think we we do need to update it to be JSON LD, a compliant at some point. Um, but that's I suppose it's the question of whether we have two divergent things now that do something similar, or whether we have the same thing, and so it's almost consistency um, versus style, I suppose. And, I, and I, I totally see your style point on the importance of, um, you know, JSON LD and, and, and that working. Obviously, the blocks inside it are JSON LD still. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just it's not just a style thing. That does 
it just niggle. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was just, for, for, for present, it just feels odd just for a, for purposes of being able to produce a list of things that we're pointing out to an entirely different specification. Um, because we're not, we're not, as far as I'm aware, we weren't planning to do that with, say, the Opportunity API, that everything becomes a page data. But in the Opportunity API, there's, there's no, this is a notifications, this is a synchronized state problem. All the rest of the Opportunity API, from what we've discussed at least, will be query based. So get me the activities near here, or get me the instructors that are whatever. Um, this is a, this requirement is actually not uh, Opportunity API core requirement. There's unlikely to be other things in the Opportunity API that involve notifications. Surely. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, guys, could I suggest we um, um, yeah. table this one? It's because now. I think we need to go into the VAT, the tax side of things. Um, okay. I would suggest. And maybe okay. two, you could have a, a cup of tea sometime together. Sort, <laughs> your, sort your differences out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry about right. that. Thanks, no, it's fine. Okay, but I mean, so <laughs> we'll take that offline. So put, everyone's happy with polling with a simple paging option. We just need to uh, sort out the details. <laughs> All right. Right. Uh, the, uh, quotes, yeah. Okay, so tax. Nick, do you want to pick this one up? Uh, sure, yes. So thanks, Jamie. Um, uh, you um, provided a really great opportunity to have a discussion with an accountant yesterday. Um, and from that discussion, in addition, thanks, Melanie, for uh, helping with some of the research with other APIs um, that, that we did a little bit of. Um, so I can give you an update on where we've got to. I don't know if this is where we, I don't know if we've yet landed on the final decision, but it's also becoming clear that there doesn't seem to be a single right answer. Uh, and, and even if we talk to the HMRC, that only represents one view in the in the world of different um, ways this can work. And so, what we've kind of landed on after that, and looking at the other APIs and what they do, is it seems maybe it seems obvious when I say it, but it's uh, keeping it so generic that actually we um, are able to cater for most scenarios. And the way that these APIs do it, and the way we we actually independently came to on the call before we looked at the APIs. Um, was uh, or is that the um, the tax uh, items are presented as line items in the receipt, and so rather than having a particular tax rate for the whole order or or for individual items at the bottom of the um, or sorry in the in the actual order itself, you have a line item for product one, a line item for product two, and then the next line is tax. Uh, line item one and then tax line item two and so what that gives you is basically a, a way of just having a name and a price for the tax so you you might write I probably should have put an actual example in here but you might write um, VAT 20% in the name and in the price you would put the amount um, and what that means you can do is in countries and jurisdictions where you have multiple tax uh, codes you can in the name you can put the percentage and the type of tax in there uh, and it, it's a string so it can just be literally whatever and then the price is there um, so that it, it, the, the, the amount that matters is uh, available as a an in, as a uh, decimal um, so so can, yeah. can I can I just ask a question I'm not sure that I, I fully understand what we're trying to do with tax here um, it's, so this is an extra line is it to the to the opportunity um, for entry. So you, you say you'll, I don't know, booking a badminton court at £10, mm. but then an extra 20% on top of that. Is that how uh, it works? Kind of. Um, Lee, could you open up Proposal 77 and just, just click on the link in there to the Stripe API? It's probably best if I just show you what they've, they've got. I should have created an example. Um, so um, basically, the, uh, the it's it's about line items in the invoice. So part of the the, the earlier parts of the conversation. Uh, so if you just click on the stripe, that's it. Um, and if you go down to order somewhere or other, there you go. Uh, that's it. Perfect. Order item, and you've got a description: CA tax with a number of tax, and then the amount and the currency. 
Um, and so what this is basically is on the receipts. So part of the discussion I skipped over is that the only place that tax seems to be required, at least from our initial conversation, is actually at the receipt stage. Uh, and even then in the UK, you can ask for a VAT receipt separately and out of band. So the system doesn't necessarily have a requirement to produce a VAT receipt as long as the customer can receive one somehow um, at some point. So, but, but if you did want to create a VAT receipt in the UK at least, um, you would need a line item on there for the tax amount. Um, and so that's what this proposal is basically saying that we just have line items on the receipt and rather than trying to over specify rates and things like that, um, and does it include VAT or not include VAT? It's just the ability to add tax line items um, that means that anyone can uh, to, can add them according to what their system is recording. And and it's I, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I I see. Um, uh, I guess though, what is slightly more of a concern? Maybe this isn't um, a question for this forum, but. As you're aware, Nick, we have some customers that are VAT exempt at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this um, potential has the potential for um, affecting their VAT exemption. So we also covered that uh, topic. Um, and although it's not, it doesn't appear to have an impact on the specification as such, um, the difference between being an agent and being a reseller in the context of a, a third party making a sale um, is an important distinction and from the conversation in most cases it's it's the it's the agent scenario that's likely so um, the uh, the third party site would be um, facilitating the transaction but they wouldn't be um, the, what, what makes a reseller a reseller is they buy the squash court and then they sell the squash court at a later point and it might be that they buy it and sell it within a second or two um, or they buy it and then uh, and, and then hold it for a couple of weeks and then sell it on a bit like with um, theatre ticket block bookings and things like that. Um, so resell it. Sorry. Would you be able to separately send me some information uh, about that so I, I can check with our customer that they'd be happy with that? Yeah. That would, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely, I will do. Um, sure. Thank you. Uh, I'll actually, I'll put, what I'll do is I'll write that up into the, um, the GitHub issue, Ros, and I'll send you a link to that so but everyone else can then see that too. Okay, great, thank you. I think it's important as well that um, this doesn't uh, mean that there needs to be VAT rate applied to every transaction. There are quite a lot of people out there that don't apply any VAT because they're not that registered. Um, so it would have to be flexible for those um, operators that don't um, apply any VAT as well. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. That, yeah, so. Um, so that's really what we've we kind of come up into on to, sorry, Nick. Um, yeah, uh, Jamie makes a point that some people are VAT registered. We need to distinguish people who are not VAT registered from those who are um, within this. I don't know if we do one. Is that a question? Sorry, Ian. Yes, it is. So um, the, the proposal at the moment in, in from um, what we talked about would, would loosely um, when you make the order or the order quote, uh, you basically say, I want to buy these items. At the point where you create the order or order quote, you get back, um, well, sorry, you, you submit um, the items you would like to be in the order. When you get the order back, you then have these, these VAT line items in that response. And so for customers that are not VAT registered, you obviously would either have a 0% line item with zero, or you would have no, no line item at all. Um, and if you have a VAT registered customer, or if internationally there were multiple tax rates applied, then you would just have all of those detailed in, in that response. I suppose my point was that if um, you're not VAT registered, you, you shouldn't put VAT as zero, because you couldn't distinguish that from a VAT rate of zero. So Sorry, you said VAT registered rather than um, VAT applicable. Uh, so I, I believe that doesn't make a difference to what's charged to the end customer. Uh, it would make a difference. To, uh, it may make a difference as to whether you had to put a VAT number on, on the receipt. Sure, that makes sense. It's so there's a, a question, Nick. I just wanted to throw it in the ring. I don't know what the answer is. No, no, no. That's really good. We should we should have raised that about VAT numbers. We certainly haven't. Um, okay, we'll go back with that then to um, see if there's a, there's something else. Uh, I think we did uh, speak yesterday about um, including the VAT number because. 
that is uh, also required on the on the receipt. Yeah, I mean, I um, think platforms have to capture those as well, don't they? Um, uh, but what you can, there, there is a difference between 0% VAT um, and no VAT um, when you're filling out your VAT return. Um, so uh, in those cases where the um, provider doesn't charge any VAT, it'd be better to put no VAT than 0%. So, so Nick, to just make sure I understand in terms of the revised flow, um, <clears throat> when I'm... As a broker, if I'm creating an order quote, then I need to tell you whether I'm a person or an organization. And then, uh, but perhaps additionally, um, there's going to be some extra information you'll need to know about the user at that point, whether they're in the UK and whether they're VAT registered and what their VAT number is. So that then when you give me the quote, the price, it, the tax calculation will all have been done on the booking platform. So from what the accountant said yesterday, the only thing that will affect whether the percentage is different from UK-based organisations is whether there's an, it's an EU to EU business to business transaction. Um, and that's specifically, so EU country to EU country. So someone in Dublin buys something here. Um, and, and in that case, you would in theory have a 0% uh, tax applied instead of 20% VAT. Um, so the reason that this, yes, yeah, so that's a good point to bring us to this bullet point. Um, the other thing that it raised was that, of course, organizations are purchasing um, as well as people. And I think the previous booking spec only really allowed the customer to be a person rather than be an organization. But of course, if you're an organization, you're purchasing as many of them, uh, my local pictures customers are, um, then we should probably have the ability to, to state that you're an organization. And if you do that and we have the organization uh, type available and there are I think there might even be a VAT number uh, in there already in the schema there's a whole bunch of um, really useful fields that we can then pull on to better describe the organization if we want to start interesting things with that but I, I, I get that I kind of got the sense from yesterday I, I don't know what you think Jamie that a lot of this is a kind of edge cases um, and that the kind of the basic case is we probably just need a VAT, a, a VAT line that says how much has been charged um, and then if we use a person and organization object that provides scope to extend in the future to include other properties such as VAT number and things like that. Um, but they don't necessarily, it sounds like need to be there from day one um, to get something working. Um, yes, I think we, we, we spoke about that point around it's not a required feature to um, issue the, the VAT receipt um, to every booking that's made. Um, I think with respect to how you could do it through the, um, uh, through the API as such, um, you would need to say those kind of, um, uh, the, 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 the amount that's being added on as VAT um, and that VAT number. So it'd be quite good maybe to see what, what that uh, response would look like. Lee, if you just jump to that third tab a second. If you, I mean, if you had something like this, and I started putting together, there's a few options in how we would do this. Within Schema, which don't quite, Schema doesn't quite have this, unfortunately, but if you look at line 11 to 19, and if we did something like this, where we had a, order item which could be a, a VAT um, item and inside that it had currency description yeah tax amount um, and we could have multiple of those for a particular receipt yeah so yes yeah, so potentially one per actual order item if you needed to, or a final total, um, it just says the VAT total at the end. Okay. So, to, to, I mean, I can show you another, if you, if you go um, back on your browser there, Lee, if you just open up the, uh, on that, on that tab, yeah, if you just open up alongside each other, the two examples I've got there, so that you've got the other one too, and you'll see in Shopify, um, something quite similar. 
just maybe control F for tax because it's quite a good page. Um, and you should see that there's a uh, there you go, tax lines. So quite a similar, quite a similar concept here where you've got the title, price, and the rate so as, a tax, as a tax line. They have the title. I'm not sure what HST is. Um, but it's a similar harmonized idea. Harmonised sales tax. Yeah. We take two different types of tax and treat them as one because it's less complicated. That sounds less complicated. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, personally, I quite like the fact that they've called these out as separate things. Mm. J just in the, the, the model, because I'm just thinking in the way that Stripe have it, um, mm. Uh, we'd have to also just, if we went that way, we'd have to make sure that the things like being able to patch or update and uh, order, you know, so we can't just remove the tax item that there are some things that are just not, not mutable. That sounds, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. In fact, if you go back again on this, uh, this tab here, um, uh, I think it's the second first bullet point of that. Uh, Yes, yeah, so subclassing um, the, what, which one was it? Yes, yeah, so that, so subclass the price specification to a tax charge specification and adding line items or tax line items properly to the order. Um, it's, so that seems like the closest thing to what we're talking about there in, in Shopify. Give us that. I, I suppose just to, sorry, back up a step, I really do go into detail there. Just on the Shopify point then, at the high level, do you think this works, line items? Does anybody? You just jump back to Shopify there to show that. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. The overlay for Zoom is getting in the way of my browser. <laughs> okay. Or actually, click on the thing. There we go. Does does does, does this work as a general approach? Having a a generic line item with a title and price rather than specifically different types of VAT encoded. Yeah, I think that, that would work for us. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, if, if we get, uh, if the options are to it, sorry, let's start again. Unless there's a need to be able to break out the tax for individual pieces, then having a single tax line item that has the total tax payable seems. Look, I'm I'm not clear about whether we're talking about this on each order line or whether it's an order total. This currently is a um, in the order there are order items, and the proposal here is to add an additional. Um, tax items um, array, which then has a list of um, price descriptions and, and totals. But that's on each line. I mean, if, assuming I was buying uh, a swimming session and uh, an aerobic session, yeah. I'd have two lines, and each line would have two taxes. So there'd be four tax lines altogether. Um, and I imagine you need a tax, a total tax as well in the in, in the overall order. Well, this was going to be the question. So I, I don't think for the VAT receipt, you need to have a, a line by line tax breakdown as long as you've got tax at the bottom as a total. So we could just do it as a total number of taxes as a total. I just, I'm going to have to go in a second, actually. I think if you're going into um, the more corporate thing, business to business, you might need to provide a breakdown by line. So there's going to be an audit trail back for what's been bought. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it should be per line. Okay. That's really helpful feedback. Thanks, guys. We'll go. Okay. Well, I know we've we've hit time. We'll we'll go away and um and and look at adding line by line, uh, but multiple types of tax, um, organization and person, like you say, that's validating business to business. Um, so I think that's probably that's probably good for now to um to move forward with that. But it does sound like we need to do a little bit more work there just to think about how. Do, um, uh, Ros Ian, do you have uh obviously you already process tax and you do do you presumably represent line items yes right so i mean it, it would it be possible for you to potentially share 
a little bit of how that works just to you know in terms of it is it is it um is it like this is it just a string and a value and multiple of those per line item or is it just one number per line item or um it's um no it's many it's many it's up to several lines per line item right um but that's we've got different modules so the the ones which are uh, more in use for example abroad where they have multiple tax rates we'd definitely be looking at be able to see the tax breakdown per line item yeah mm. but that's typically for kind of high value um, events for things like classes and, and activities which are more what we see in the uk um we would only show a breakdown on the receipt that the overall receipt rather than per line so it's a bit of a mixed bag really i'm afraid still helpful that's really great uh ros did you have any thoughts on that um, yeah, well, we're not doing this sort of thing at the moment, um, but I, I can see it would be needed. Um, and like I say, I think it would be preferable to have it per line item. Okay. At, at the moment, do you capture tax at all or, or not, not so much? No, no. Ah, brilliant. Okay, that's good to know. So there is at least a use case here where there's just taxes. No, no, no tax functionality is fine. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, that's really, really helpful. So it sounds like we need both line items and lines, uh, and we can, we'll look at ways of doing that with the tax line specifically. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna uh, try and wrap up the call because I know, uh, oh, I think it's, Ian has already gone. Um, the, uh, we, our next call is on the 5th of December. Um, wants to check on the, what people would like to, Discuss the topic there. Should we continue further on the booking spec, or are there other bits of the uh, standards and tools work that we, we should make some time for? So maybe some more time for activity lists. Any any preferences? Would you prefer to plow on with booking? I think speaking for the people not present, uh, I think I think booking uh, is is the thing that people are even if they care less about yeah. tax, hence the lack of attendance today because. Obviously, everyone wants tax to be sorted. No one actually cares that much about how it's sorted. Um, okay. But uh, I think if we if we have another call in the fifth, and if we aim to get a proposal for them ready, we're, sorry, a, a, a revised spec ready, uh, which includes the new flows, includes the um, the new approach for cancellations and uh, a suggestion on tax to move that forward, um, then um, that so it sounds like we've got enough at least to propose something on each of those. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it's uh, sounds like a good idea. Um, and then because it's Christmas, uh, we won't have a call on the nineteenth or the second. Um, so we'll then so after the fifth, we'll pick up these calls in the new year. Um, but obviously, we'll uh, continue to take on feedback on the drafts uh, in at least some of that period. When people aren't on holiday. Brilliant. So we'll, we'll aim to, because I know that, that um, Legend for One are waiting to start the booking work until we have signed this, this is all sorted. So if we, if we, I don't know if this is maybe ambitious, but if, if everyone's happy in the next call, uh, then potentially we can get to a position where we're putting it out for, for the final comments for V1 uh, over Christmas. So we can get it signed off and, and done. Uh, January. Yes, that's it. that sounds good. Super. Cool. Okay, thanks again, everybody, for attending and giving us some useful feedback on plans. Um, I'll speak to you all in a couple of weeks.